Hello and welcome all. Today we will be continuing with our lecture series on design of pre-engineered building, PEV building. In this lecture series, what we are doing is we are learning how to analyze, how to model, analyze and design a steel pre-engineered building. We have completed two lectures in this lecture series until now and today will be our third lecture. In our previous, that is second lecture of this series, we learned how to model the pre-engineered building. And the pre-engineered building model that you are seeing on your screen right now is the one that we modeled in our previous lecture. We completed modeling of columns, rafter, beams, and bracings. And today we will learn about calculating and assigning different types of loads on our PV structure. So we will start our lecture today first with definition of or defining different load patterns, load cases, and load combinations. So for that, go to define menu, open your ETAPS model first, and then go to define menu. Under define menu, select load patterns. You can see here, Two load patterns are already given, dead load with self weight multiplier of 1 and live load with self weight multiplier 0. Now we will be adding some other loads besides these two kinds of load. One load that may be present in your pre-engineered building is the loads on your roof, excluding the dead load and live load. For example, if you have solar panels installed on your roof or if you have different uh, pipelines of SVAC services or other kinds of equipments on your roof, then you can calculate the load coming onto the roof from those equipments and then you can define a separate load pattern for those types of loads. But in our case, we suppose now that except roof seating, there is not any other superimposed dead load present on our roof. So we will not be defining a different load pattern for that kind of load. And besides, an important load acting on our PEV structure is the wind load. So if you see on our diagram, there are this is a rectangular pre-engineered building and there are four sides. So our wind may come onto our structure or the wind load may act on our structure from all of these four sides. So we will be defining four different types of wind loads on our load patterns. Remember how the wind load acts on our structure is if there are claddings present on our steel structure or this kind of structure, some uh, prefabricated walls or any other type of cladding, first the wind load acts on those cladding. And from those cladding, that wind load is transferred to the secondary structures that support those claddings. And those secondary structures in our case are these columns and these bracings. These columns in our structure are present on both the wall side and also on the gable end side. So we will analyze our structure in such a way that we directly apply the wind load on these structures supporting the cladding, that is onto these columns and beams. We will apply our wind load says uniformly distributed load and we will learn later in this lecture about how to calculate those wind loads also. So for the wind loads coming onto our structure from four different directions, let us define four different wind loads. First, I will define as WL1 type is wind and let's keep auto lateral load as none for now because we are not going to depend on our IS code for the application of these loads, but rather we are going to calculate our loads as uniformly distributed loads and apply them manually on our structure. For that, we do not need for now to select auto lateral load. Keep this as none. Add new load. Second, WL2. Same type wind, self weight multiplier 0, auto lateral load none. Add. Another will be WL3. Add and another will be WL4 add. So these are our four wind load patterns, WL1 to WL4 for the wind load coming onto our structure from four different directions. And then we will add earthquake load. For that, 
first eqx will be our earthquake load coming onto our structure from the x direction type will be seismic and auto lateral load we will select is 1893 2016 add new load and similarly for y direction eq y add new load now eqx let's modify our lateral load uncheck all the boxes excluding the x direction only this box our response rate our story range first will be base to story 2 story 2 means our ridge level the response reduction factor for our steel structure will be 3 you can find this response reduction factor value from table 9 in is 1893 2016 code our seismic zone factor power code will be 0 0.36 for zone 5 let us suppose that our site type has medium swell so site type will be 2 and importance factor is 1 and for the time period of our structure let us keep the time period for now as program calculated remember in this response reduction factor this value of 3 is for steel structure with ordinary moment resisting frame and we have also stated that our structure lies in zone 5 so earthquake seismic zone factor will be 0 0.36 however although we have done this for now what our code says under that table 9 is in seismic zones 3 2 3 and sorry 3 4 and 5 the structures with ordinary moment resisting frames are not allowed as per codal guidelines we have to construct we have to design special moment resisting frames for both rc structures and steel structures in zones 3 4 and 5 however for now we will keep this response reduction factor as 3 and choose the seismic zone factor as 5 click on ok similarly modify your load for earthquake in y direction left click on modify lateral load uncheck all these boxes except y direction response reduction factor 3 and other same as eqx we do not have to change anything here click on ok and ok save the model now after defining load pattern if you go to again define and load cases you will see that all of the load patterns have their corresponding load cases made here so click on ok now if you are also going to perform dynamic analysis in our case response spectrum analysis then you will have to define the response spectrum function and the corresponding load cases also so go to define menu if you want to learn in detail about response spectrum function there is a separate lecture series with four videos on response spectrum function i have discussed in detail about the theoretical aspect of dynamic analysis and also the etaps demonstration of a response spectrum function in that lecture series I will post a link of that lecture series below this video. For now, we will go to define functions and response spectrum. Choose function type to add from this drop down list is IS 1893 2016 and then add new function. I will rename our function as IS 1893. Damping ratio for steel structure is 5% is okay, seismic zone 5 seismic zone factor 0 0.36 importance factor 1 swell type 2 we do not have to change anything response reduction factor 3 so we got our response spectrum function here click on ok our response spectrum function is defined here as is 1893 and then click on ok here now go to define and load cases add new case we will say that this is response spectrum function in x direction because we are defining load case for response spectrum function load case type will be response spectrum and okay first let's define mass source here cancel cancel go to define mass source okay we'll just modify this mass source let's name this mass source our mass source is composed of element self mass i will uncheck this element self mass additional mass and specified load patterns 
so after i uncheck this element self mass i have to insert here the dead load pattern also so dead load will be one add our live load the only live load coming onto our structure is the roof life load the roof life load do not participate in the mass source so we will not include this live load and besides this dead and live load we do not have any other type of load that will be included in the mass source if there were a different load pattern for such structures as solar panels on the roof as i discussed previously then you have to include that type of load pattern also here but for now only dead load is added it's okay here so left click and okay left click and okay again and now let's go to defining load cases for response spectrum define load cases add new load case rscx i name it load case type is a response spectrum and the loads applied will be if you click on add here this is acceleration load name will be u1 in x direction and our function will be the response spectrum function that we defined earlier that is is1893 for this scale factor i also discussed the concept of scale factor in our previous lecture this scale factor will be first you have to check the units of your uh, model here so i click on ok for now i will come back to this to change it i will click again ok on your screen on the right hand bottom side click on these units and select show units form you will see that your acceleration you have to find the units of acceleration in this units form here let's see where is the value of acceleration okay here acceleration is defined in terms of millimeter per second square so let's change this millimeter to meter meter per second square so click on ok now let's go to define load cases again in this rsx let's click on modifier showcase so our response spectrum factor if you remember the previous response factor it was some thing like 9800 which was in millimeter per second square now after changing the units of acceleration it is 9.81 meter per second square you can change this response factor according to the concept that we discussed in our response spectrum analysis lecture series or you can keep this scale factor same for now i will keep it same for now 9.81 other parameters load cases combination method let's keep the default values here and then click on ok now add copy select this rsx and then click on add copy of case so let's name this rsy other things will be the same except that the load supplied will be acceleration in u2 direction and then click on ok so we have load cases defined here for response spectrum function also now click on ok save your model so now we have defined our load cases and load patterns and i will define load combinations for now by generating some default design combos based on our default design code that is is800 you have to make some corrections in those auto generated load combinations that corrections we will see in our upcoming lecture next lecture before performing the design of our structure so for now go to define load combinations okay 46 load combinations have already been generated here so what i will do is i will just select all these load combinations and i will delete these combinations now it is blank here and then click on add default design combos select steel frame design and then click on ok okay let me delete these combos again okay now then click on add default design combos and then click on steel frame design and also click on convert to user combinations editable because you have to make corrections to these load combinations i will talk about that in our next lecture so click on this convert to user combination and then click on ok so let's see here 52 load combinations have been generated based on our load patterns 
click on ok we will discuss about this in detail in our next lecture and then save a model so now that we are completed with defining load pattern load cases load combinations mass source response spectrum functions and all of the things necessary let's go to the aspect of applying calculating and applying our loads for now so this upcoming uh, load calculation and load application is somewhat rigorous in nature if you do not understand while watching the video once please do try to watch it two three four times before you become clear about this calculation and application of load particularly that of the wind load so let's go to that portion now i have prepared uh, this math card sheet related with the calculation of load for pre-engineered building or steel truss structure here this math card is a software particularly useful for calculations related to structural engineering and i'm also new to this software and i'm just i have just started to learn about this software so i have prepared uh, a sheet related to calculation of load in the same software also this is not a perfect uh, calculation sheet but just uh, to make you understand and for my own practice also i have made the details in this mathcad software and if needed i can convert this sheet into pdf and if required i can provide you with this calculation also so now let's enter into the calculation of load so first we have the structural details here if you see the length of our building is 91.15 meter you can see this or calculate this length from your autocad file of any pre-engineered building or of any structure the length of our building is 91.15 meter our width is 40 meter and we suppose that our center to center spacing of purlins is 1.50 meter these purlins are necessary to bear the load of roofing sheet coming from above we haven't modeled the purlin in our structure we will just uh, calculate the self weight of purlin and apply those loads on our beams for now we will suppose that the center to center spacing of our purlins is 1.50 meter if you see on this left hand side there are some symbols i have uh, made some symbols for these descriptions for example yes underscore p is the center to center spacing of purlin now the base spacing for center is 7.667 meter that means these center columns except this column at one gable end and another column at another gable end the columns in the center are spaced at a distance of 7.667 meter in both ends left and right that is base spacing for center is 7.667 and the base spacing for gable end is 7.242 our clear eave height is 5 meter and our maximum eave height that means the height from ground level to the ridge of our structure is 7 meter and the slope of the roof you can calculate in this way for example if this is our truss we know this value 2 meter and we know this value which is 20 meter 20 meter using these two values and using the properties of a right angle triangle you can calculate the value of the slope of this truss or slope of this roof here i have got the slope of the roof is 10 degrees now dead load first coming to dead load if you refer is 875 part 1 in that IS 875 part 1, what you can get is you can get the dead load of roofing seats based on their properties. For example, if you are using your roofing seats as galvanized corrugated iron seats, then you can acquire or you can get the value of dead load from IS 875 part 1. For now, what I have done is I have supposed that the weight of seating 
that is roof seating, the weight of purlins and the weight of sag rods all together is 0.15 kN per meter square. I discussed upon this uh, approximate value of dead load in our first lecture of this series also. You can go through that. If you have the sections for purlins and sag rods, then you can calculate the weight of those sections per unit meter and convert those per unit meter loads into per meter square load also. But in this portion for now what I have supposed is that the cumulative load of these three dead loads that is sitting in purlins and sag rods is 0.15 kN per meter square. So what we are doing is since we are applying our all different types of loads in kilonewton per meter that is in uh, is a uniformly distributed load we have to change this 0.15 kilonewton per meter square into a load in kilonewton per meter and for that what we do is we multiply this uniformly distributed load that is we multiply this 0.15 kilonewton per meter square with the base spacing and since the base spacing is different for center and gable end, what we do is for the center, that is for the beams at the center, we will multiply this W by SBC. We get 1.15 kN per meter. Whereas for the gable end frames, we multiply this W by SBG, that is 7.242 meter, and then divide by 2, 0.543. So why do we do this is that let's see here. If this is our pollens or this is our beams, suppose that this is our, these are our beams here. So this beam is a gable end beam and this beam is a gable end beam. And these two beams are at the center. So what happens is the load coming onto this. Let's let's take a, let's take this beam for example. The loads coming onto this beam is contributed by half of the load coming from this area and half of the load coming from this area. That means these two areas, these shaded portions, are contributing to uniformly distributed load acting on this beam. Whereas, if you consider any gable end beam, for example, this beam, only the half of this area, that is the area from the left hand side is contributing to the load coming onto this gable end beam. There is no half portion to the right hand side. So what we do is, we multiply the base spacing at the center with the area load 0.15 kN per meter square to obtain the dead load acting onto these center beams whereas for gable end beams we multiply the gable end spacing and 0.15 kN per meter square and then divide by 2 to get the contribution of this half area that is contributing to the load acting onto this beam. Using that concept dead load 1 will be 1.15 kN per meter and dead load 2 will be 0.543 kN per meter. So now before going to live load let us apply this dead load onto our structure. For that one thing that will make you easy when applying different types of load onto this structure is to class Specify different types of elements available in your model into different types of groups. For example, let's see here. Okay, let me just check here. For that, what we will do is suppose let us select these five columns here. I have selected these five columns and then go to assign and then assign objects to group option. Here I already have uh, named and assigned different types of groups here because 
showing all this classification will take time i will just show you one example of how to assign these different frames into groups so i selected these five options i went to this option assign and assign objects to group option now you have to create a different group name if you want to add these objects to an existing group name you have to select that group name here otherwise go to modify and show definitions and here different types of groups have been defined here i will click on add and in this group one what i will rename this is gable two columns and then click on okay so gable two columns has been added here now select these gable two columns option you have already selected five of these columns choose this either add to group or a replace group and then click on apply and then click on ok so these five columns have been added to one group what i have done here is that let me first all of these okay i will show you one by one let's see what are gable one columns click on gable one columns okay i will close this and then i will go to select select groups now i have named different groups here so gable two columns i just defined earlier select see these gable one columns what are these gable one columns you will see that these gable one columns are the columns at the other gable end all these five columns except this column at the is except this column at the is I have defined these groups on the basis of different types of wind load that will be coming onto these structures. So gable one columns are the five columns at one gable end and choose deselect here and select again gable two columns. This gable two columns are the five columns, five center columns at the other end. Again deselect. Now what are left center columns? Select. Left center columns are all of these columns at the left hand side of this that is if this is the positive y axis then on this positive y axis side these are the left center columns except this one at the end left center rafters left center columns let us deselect now left center rafters left center rafters or you can call these beams also these are all these selected beams here except these beams at the gable end except these beams at the gable end left center rafters or left center beams are the beams at the left end and left gable columns let me deselect this left gable columns are these columns at the two end on the left hand side these columns at the two end similarly left gable rafters are now we rename these center rafters as left center rafters now left gable rafters are these rafters at the ends that is gable end similarly right center column means the center columns at the right end right center rafter means these rafters at the right end right gable column means this column and this column at the is and right gable rafter means these rafters in the right hand side at the gable end in this way i have created different groups and then assigned the different frames of our structure to these different groups so that it will be easy by application of load instead of choosing one each frame one by one you can just select the frames according to these groups and then apply the load so let's click and close let's save the model now let's go back to our calculation here our dead load is 1.15 kN per meter in the center span. So what I will do is I will go to select and then select groups. 
so i will select here left center rafters and right center rafters select so all of these beams have been selected except the gable end beams in both left and right then i will go to assign frame sorry frame loads and distributed so this will be our dead load acting in the gravity direction and you saw here the value of our dead load was 1.15 kilonewton 1.15 kilonewton per meter click on ok so this is our dead load similarly now i will select the left gable rafters and then the right gable rafters so as you can see here these rafters have been selected our dead load for these rafters will be 0.543 kilonewton per meter so assign frame load distributed again dead load gravity 0.543 click on ok so this is our dead load and this dead load means the loads that is coming onto the our structure from the roof seating any purlins present in our structure and then the sag rods so we have selected and applied the dead load now similarly for live load if you refer to is875 part 2 since our live load is live load for roof with no access our live load will be 0.75 kilonewton per meter square now to convert this into uniformly distributed load similar is the case similar according to dead load for the live load in center span live load into this distance 7.667 which comes out to be 5.75 kilonewton per meter and then live load for gable end span will be live load into 7.242 meter divided by 2 which comes out to be 2.716 meter so first 5.75 meter again go to your etabs model select the left center rafters and the right center rafters select you can see this have been selected go to assign frame loads and distributed now this will be our live load direction will be gravity live load will be 5.75 kilonewton per meter click on ok so you see this is our live load similarly select your left gable rafters and right gable rafters your this gable and rafters are selected let's see back see in our seat again our live load will be 2.716 so go to assign frame load distributed it is live load direction gravity 2.716 click on ok so i will close this and let's just check any rafter here or any beam here you see the loads assigned dead load and live load similarly for end dead load and live load go to assign clear display of assigns everything will be removed here and then save the model so now we have applied our dead load and live load now let's go to the important aspect the most important part of this lecture that is the wind load so let's see here wind load we calculate and assign the wind load according to is875 part 3 this IS875 part 3 was latest revised in 2015 and after the revision there were two amendments made to this code one was in, one was in April 2016 and another was in uh, I guess it was in 2020 so what is the difference between applying dead load sorry what is the difference between applying earthquake load and wind load let us discuss in very sort before going on to this application of wind load so you know that the main philosophy behind the wind design is that is compared to earthquake loads because earthquake events do not occur frequently but wind blows every time although there may not be any extreme wind event but generally wind 
which means the movement of air is happening all the time. So it means that a structure is always subjected to wind-induced lateral force. So what we did in earthquake analysis was that generally during earthquake load analysis, we are allowed to perform a nonlinear analysis for earthquake load and also some damage is allowed in the structure for energy dissipation when it is acted upon by earthquake load. In contrary, for wind design, what we try to do is that we try to keep the structure in elastic range. Since the wind load is always acting, although the magnitude of load acting may be variable, wind load is that type of load which is always acting in our structure. So we try to keep the structure in elastic range. We do not allow the deformation of our structure under the application of wind load and we design for full wind force. This is a one major difference in earthquake load design and wind design. And another major aspect is that wind force is only generated over the exposed surface and we do not have to apply the wind load for hidden items. For example, in our structure also, we apply the wind loads only for these exposed parts. We do not apply wind loads onto these inner columns or if there were any inner structure, we do not apply wind load onto those structures. We only apply the wind load onto these exposed surfaces. So saying that, now let's go to the calculation of wind load. For that, the first aspect or the first thing to do is you to know the design wind speed in your area. Here I have taken the design wind speed as 33 meter per second. If you are designing according to IS code, IS875 part 3, that is the design load for wind loads, then in that code, uh, different basic wind speed have been given for different regions of India. And if you have to design for any structure in your country which is different from India, then you have to know the basic design, uh, you have to know the basic wind speed in your area. And the primary thing or the primary principle in determining the basic wind speed is that what IS code adopts is that this basic wind speed is based on gust velocity of wind for a period of 3 seconds. And this wind load should be acting at a height of 10 meter above the ground level for the structure. And then this basic wind speed should have a return period of 50 years. So there are three basic principles relating to the basic wind speed in your area. That is gust velocity based on 3 seconds period acting at a height of 10 meter above the mean ground level and then the wind should have a design return period of 50 years. If you have these criteria based wind speed on your area, if you have sufficient meteorological data and based on those meteorological data, you can derive the wind speed based on those three criteria, then you can adopt that design speed and then design according to the Indian code. But those three principles must be adopted while calculating the basic wind speed. So our basic wind speed, let us say, is 33 meter per second. Clause 6.3 says that this basic wind speed has to be converted into the design wind speed. And how you get the design speed? By multiplying the basic wind speed, VV, by four factors, K1, K2, K3, and K4. Where K1 is the probability factor or risk coefficient, K2 is the terrain roughness and height factor. You can see the corresponding clause that you have to follow 6.3.1 for K, 6.3.2 for K2, K3 is the topography factor 6.3.3 and K4 is the importance factor for the cyclonic region 6.3.4. So from these four clauses de determine the values of K1 to K4 and then multiply all these coefficients with the basic wind speed VV to obtain the design wind speed VZ. So risk coefficient K1 you obtain from table 1. So what table 1 says is that for all, let me just increase the size, 
for all general buildings and structures with mean probable design life of structure 50 years you can take the k1 factor is one for all different design speeds or for all different basic wind speed since our basic wind speed is 33 we suppose it is our general building and structure with mean probable design life of 50 years we obtain k1 is one year similarly k2 is the terrain roughness and height factor which you obtain from table 2 that is factors to obtain design wind speed variation with height in different terrains so based on the height of your structure and based on the terrain category which is category 1 2 3 4 you can select your k2 factor let's go to is 875 clause and see what are terrain categories 1 to 4 okay let's see here in clause 6.3.2.1 what it says is that category 1 means exposed open terrain with few or no obstructions and in which the average height of any object surrounding the structure is less than 1.5 meter category 2 is open terrain with well scattered obstruction having heights generally between 1.5 meter and 10 meter category 3 is terrain with numerous closely spaced obstructions having the size of buildings or structures up to 10 meter in height with or without a few isolated tall structures and category 4 is terrain with numerous large high closely spaced obstructions so based on these different categories on which in which type your structure is going to be built and based on the height of your structure you can determine the value of k2 so let's see here we suppose that our terrain category is 2 and the height is 10 meter so we will not be decreasing this coefficient for height less than 10 meter we will just adopt this k2 value of one year so from this you get the value of k2 similarly k3 will be your topography factor which will be one if you look at clause 6.3.3.1 what it says is that the value of k3 varies with height above ground level at a maximum near the ground and reducing to one at higher levels you can take the value of k3 as one and k4 our structure is not located in the region which is important for cyclonic activities so we will take k4 as one so all the values of these factors k1 k2 k3 k4 you got as one now our design wind speed will be basic wind speed 33 into 1 into 1 into 1 into 1 i have missed here k4 this will also be 1 so your design wind speed also according to clause 6.3 we get is 33 meter per second now after calculating the design speed we have to calculate the wind pressure and then design wind pressure so wind pressure value our code 7.2 gives us 0.6 vz square where vz is the design wind velocity we got our design wind speed is 33 meter per second so 0.6 into 33 square you get is 0.653 kilonewton per meter square just forget this units at the beginning or to the left of these units here you get 0.6 into 33 square is 0.653 kilonewton per meter square now after determining this wind pressure at height z which is 0.653 similar to wind speed you have to calc convert this wind pressure to the design wind pressure and design wind pressure is obtained by multiplying our wind pressure pz by three factors which are kd ka and kc KD is the wind directionality factor, KA is the area averaging factor, and KC is the combination factor. So let's see first what is KD or wind directionality factor. Let's see here what it says is that considering the randomness in the directionality of wind, 
and recognizing the fact that pressure or force coefficients are determined for specific wind directions. It is specified that for buildings, solid signs, see here. For buildings, solid signs, open signs, lattice framework and truss towers, a factor of 0.90 may be used under design wind pressure. So our KD will be 0.9. And for circular or near circular forms, this factor may be taken as 1. So this KD factor is important because what it recognizes is that there is a reduced probability of maximum wind coming from any given direction. We do not always have maximum wind coming onto our structure, although we are designing for maximum wind. So this using 0.9 factor for KD decreases the value of our design wind pressure because the fact is that there is a reduced probability of maximum wind coming from any given direction and also there is a reduced probability of the maximum pressure coefficient occurring for any given wind direction. So whichever direction we are supposing that the maximum wind force or wind pressure is coming from, it may not always be that direction. And in that case, designing for the full or maximum wind pressure may be uneconomical. So we will use this directionality factor and according to our clause 7.2.1, we get this KDS 0.9. Similarly, our area averaging factor you get from 7.2.2. What it says is that in table 4, if your tributary area is less than or equal to 10 meter square, take area averaging factor as 1. If your tributary area is 25 meter square, take it as 0.9. And if it is greater than or equal to 100, take it as 0.8. Linear interpolation for intermediate values. So, what is tributary area or how is tributary area calculated? For overall structure, for evaluating loads and frames, the tributary area shall be taken as the center to center distance between frames. We saw this in our diagram here. This is the tributary area. Center to center distance between frames multiplied by the individual panel dimension in the other direction together with overall pressure coefficient. And for individual elements, for beam type elements, purlins, etc., the tributary area shall be taken as the effective span multiplied by spacing. The effective span is the actual span for mid span and cantilever load effects, and half the sum of adjacent span for support moments and reactions. So we take this area averaging factor Ka is 0.8 and finally our Kc combination factor will be 0.9 according to our clause 7.3.3.13. What it says is that when taking wind loads on frames of clad buildings, it is reasonable to assume that the pressure or suctions inside and outside the structure shall not be fully correlated. Therefore, when taking the combined effect of wind loads on the frame, a reduction factor of Kc is equal to 0.90 may be used over the building envelope when roof is subjected to pressure and internal pressure is suction or vice versa. So Kc we take at 0.9. So Kd 0.9, Ka 0.9 and Kc is 0.9. Multiplying these three factors we get as 0.648. However, there is a clause in our structure or in our code that if the product of these three factors is less than 0.7, we have to take the minimum value that is 0.7. So since the product comes out to be 0.648, which is less than 0.7, we take the value at 0.7. And finally, our design wind pressure will be this product value 0.7 into our wind pressure. 0.653 which we get as 0.457 kilonewton per meter squared now what we did up till now is that first we got the value of basic wind speed in our area we converted that to design wind speed we use the value of design wind speed to get the value of wind pressure at height h and that wind pressure at height h we converted it to design wind pressure 
and we got the design wind pressure is 0.457 kN per meter square and now we come to the part where we calculate the pressure coefficients for individual members because that pressure coefficients will be used to calculate the wind load on individual members and that wind load will be applied to our structure so let's see here what clause 7.3.1 says is that when calculating the wind load on individual structural elements such as roofs and walls and individual cladding units and their fittings it is essential to take the account of the pressure difference between opposite faces of such elements or units so what we get for any individual structural element or cladding unit the wind load acting on that uh, element will be the difference of cpe minus cpi into a into pd where pd is the design wind pressure that we obtain above a is the surface area of structural elemental cladding unit this can be found out from our geometry or from our structural model and these two coefficients we have to calculate from the code itself cpe which is the external pressure coefficient and cpi is the internal pressure coefficient so from where we calculate these two values let's see here cpi or internal pressure coefficient we calculate from 7.3.2 I'm not going to read all these clauses for 7.3.2. Let me just go to the major part. So what we have to know is these values of internal pressure coefficients or CPI. These values are obtained from different uh, different experiments these are empirical values and different we perform wind tunnel test that is wind tunnel test means uh, that experiment that is designed to study the effect of wind on our structure and we perform different wind tunnel tests on simulated models and simulated environment to obtain these values of internal and external pressure coefficients external pressure coefficients majorly internal pressure coefficients we calculate from the area of openings that is present in our structure internal pressure coefficients are dependent upon the areas of openings present in our structure whereas the external pressure coefficients are obtained from wind tunnel test on simulated model and simulated environment and these both are these both coefficients are non-dimensional coefficients so what is internal pressure coefficient to obtain the value of internal pressure coefficient what you have to do is first find the area of your structure the area of our structure is length into height we have only considered here one surface for example this surface here for this length into height we get the length into height is 455.75 meter square and if you go to our autocad model or if you see our diagram you see that there are three openings one two openings had length and height of 4 meter and 3 meter so 12 meter square area and one had 4 meter and 5 meter which is 20 meter square area that means the area of our openings will be 44 meter square so what is the percentage of openings in our structure 44 divided by 455.75 into 100 that is 9.654 percentage opening is present in our structure and this 9.654 so what our clause 7.3.2 says is that if the area of openings is less than 5 percent our internal pressure coefficients, coefficients will be plus minus 0.2 it may be plus 0.2 or minus 0.2 you have to calculate wind loads based on both positive and negative internal pressure coefficients if the percentage of opening is between 5 and 20 our pressure coefficients will be plus 0.5 and minus 0.5 whereas for openings greater than 20 percent it will be plus 0.7 and minus 0.7 
Now, since the percentage area of openings lies between 5 and 20 percent, the internal pressure coefficient will be plus 0.5 and minus 0.5, and that is based on clause 7.3.2.2. Similarly, now for external pressure coefficients, it is a little different. Our external pressure coefficients we have to obtain for walls and roof. For walls, the external pressure coefficient is obtained from table 5 and for roof, it is obtained from table 6. What we have to do is, to calculate the external pressure coefficient, first find the ratio of height to width of the building. We get this to be 0 0.1 to 5 and then calculate the ratio of length to width of the building. We get this to be 2.279 meter. Now go to table 5. First see this first column building height ratio. Our building height ratio that is S by W ratio is 0 0.1 to 5 which means it is less than or equal to 0 0.5. So see this first row here. If it was greater than 1 by 2 then you have to go to this second row. But since it is less than 0 0.1 to 5 this is first row. And in this first row our building plan ratio is 2.279 which is greater than 1.5 but less than 4 so see this row which is bounded by a red rectangle once again first calculate this building height ratio it is less than 0 0.5 so we look at this first row and in this first row also since our building plan ratio which is 2.279 lies between 1.5 and 4 we see this second ratio and let's see here what is happening here is that we have pressure coefficients for a b c d that means four different sides of our structure and these pressure coefficients are based on the wind angle also for example let's see here angle theta is given if theta is zero degree that means the wind is coming from this a direction then our coefficient will be plus 0.7 for a minus 0.25 for b and minus 0.6 minus 0.6 for c and d which is our gable ends similarly if the wind is coming from 90 degree this theta 90 degree means wind is coming from above from this c direction then our coefficients will be minus 0.6 for a minus 0.5 for b and for gable and C and D, it will be plus 0 0.7 and minus 0 0.1. These pressure coefficients I have listed below here like this. For example, let's see again here. When wind was coming from left, that means theta equals to 0 degree, then it was plus 0 0.7 minus 0 0.25 minus 0 0.6 minus 0 0.6. Look here, plus 0 0.7 minus 0 0.5 sorry minus 0 0.25 and minus 0 0.6 minus 0 0.6 similarly when the wind was coming from 90 degree that is from c direction it was minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.7 and minus 0 0.1 that means minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.7 minus 0 0.1 for easiness, I have kept this subscript here. CPE is external coefficient everything where this W means wall end and this G means gable end. This 0, 90, 0, 90 means wind coming from 0 degree or 90 degree. That means from A surface or C surface. And L means left and R means right. So I have just listed out these coefficients based on that table 5 results. Similarly, for roof, you have to go to table 6 and our height to width ratio is great, less than 0 0.5 because we got this at 0 0.1 to 5. So go to see the first row in that table 6. Our roof angle we calculated at the beginning was 10 degree. So see this third row here. In this third row, our roof coefficients are now for wind angle 0 degree, minus 1.2 and minus 0 0.4. And for wind angle 90 degree, minus 0 0.8 and minus 0 0.6. I have listed out here. For wind angle 0 degree, minus 0 0.6. Not here, sorry. 
minus 1.2 and minus 0.4 similarly for wind angle 90 degree minus 0.8 and minus 0.6 so what this 0 degree and 90 degree means is that for example if this is our building any building here if wind is coming from this direction and flowing on to this direction that means since this is our ridge level our wind is traveling along the ridge that is from one gable end of our building to another gable end behind the back this is wind along the ridge but if our wind is coming from this side and then blowing on to this another side our ridge is here so our wind is blowing across the ridge so if you consider this as a and this behind this a we have b here and one gable end c here d let's see the plan of this building is given in our code here a this surface b behind this c and d and our angle is calculated this way here theta so angle theta is zero means the wind is blowing from a to b e to b means across the ridge and if angle theta means 90 degree wind is blowing from c to d that means along the ridge so across the ridge a to b and along the ridge c to d so we have done the same thing here first let's see wind across the ridge I will describe in detail one diagram and then you can calculate the other for the same what I have done is first I have calculated the load across the ridge that is I have considered the wind across the ridge and then I have calculated the forces in our structure first along the walls and then along the gable end so I have four cases here wind across the ridge with negative internal pressure coefficient CPI wind across the ridge with positive CPI, wind parallel to ridge with positive CPI, and wind parallel to ridge with negative CPI. And then we have calculated, or I have calculated here, wind loads for these four cases. And again, for the same four cases, I have calculated the wind load on the gable region. So let's see here first. If you remember uh, at the beginning of our lecture when defining the wind loads we defined four wind loads WL1, WL2, WL3 and WL4 so these four wind loads now you will see here now WL1 means wind across the ridge with negative CPI that means let's see the diagram again here WL1 means wind across the ridge with negative CPI negative internal pressure coefficient so our negative CPI is minus 0.5 and let's see when wind is blowing across the ridge our external pressure coefficient is which is our external pressure coefficient since we are calculating so we'll have we have different external pressure coefficient for walls and roof so let's see here our internal pressure coefficient will be the same for negative cpi means minus 0.5 here everywhere now our external pressure coefficient will be wind blowing across the ridge means it is blowing from left and zero degree so the cpe or external pressure coefficient will be for wind blowing across the ridge in our roof this r means in our roof across the ridge means it is zero degree and from left we get minus 1.2 so minus 1.2 since we have to calculate cpe minus cpi in this formula let's see again here cpe minus cpi i have done the same everywhere 
CPE minus CPI we get minus 0 0.7 and to calculate the wind load on this part of the roof for the left part of this roof it is CPE in minus CPI that is minus 0 0.7 into the base facing for center columns 7.667 and then the design wind pressure we get our wind load is minus 2.455 kilonewton per meter so minus means this wind is wind load is acting away from our structure similarly for the walls on our left hand side coefficient for wall we get the wind pressure coefficient external pressure coefficient is 0 0.70 because w means on wall across the ridge means 0 degree and this is for the left wall so 0 0.7 so 0 0.7 minus minus 0 0.5 will be 1.2 and 1.2 into same formula you get 4.208 positive value means this wind load is acting towards this structure similarly now for the other half of our structure for let us first consider this roof here what will be our wind pressure coefficient on this roof now this is our right hand side roof so again let's see here our external pressure coefficient for our roof this first R means roof, 0 degree means the wind is blowing across the ridge for our case 1 and R means the right hand side roof, you get minus 0 0.4. So minus 0 0.4 minus minus 0 0.5 you get 0 0.1, 0 0.1 into the same formula you get 0 0.351 towards the structure or towards the roof. And finally for this wall on the right hand side our external pressure coefficient is minus 0 0.25 here minus 0 0.25 minus minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.25 and 0 0.25 into the same formula the spacing base spacing at the center 7.667 meter into the design wind pressure that we calculated you get 0 0.877 kilonewton per meter so 0 0.877 I have shown the wrong direction here since this is positive direction this wind load will be acting towards the walls here. So this will be up towards the opposite side. So this will be the wind load acting onto this uh, right hand side walls. So this is how you calculate the wind across the ridge with negative CPI for the first case that is WL1. Now same thing you have to repeat for WL2. WL2 means wind across the ridge. So wind across the ridge means you will take the same external pressure coefficient that you have taken in this case one and accept that the CPI value you will take is positive that is plus 0 0.5 and then you will perform similar type of calculations here. And then you will get WL2 value. And in the third case, wind parallel to ridge with positive CPI, we suppose that wind is WL3. Now, for wind parallel to ridge, what you will take is, you will take this 90 degree value. This 0 degree, 0, 0, 0, we took for case 1 and 2. Now this 90 degree, 90, 90, 90, you take for cases 3 and 4. In a similar way, you can calculate CPE minus CPI and then calculate the pressure or forces on our roofs and walls and both left and right hand side. Similarly, fourth case, when parallel to ridge with negative CPI, you calculate WL4 in a similar way. So after completing for all these four cases for calculation of wind loads on left and right hand side on you and then on your roofs you have to repeat these four cases for determining the wind loads on your gable end structures or gable end columns similar is the case that you do for gable end columns you first calculate the value of cpe minus cpi and then use the formula to calculate the wind load for those structures on those gable end now in this gable end this negative value of our wind load means that it is our suction pressure that means this wind load is deflecting our columns inward 
inward towards the structure or towards the inside of the structure whereas the positive value of pressure means there is pressure from inside to outside that means these columns are being deflected out of the structure or outside of the structure so repeat those four cases using the coefficients that you obtained for gable reason which these were the coefficients on our right hand side here repeat those four cases two cases wind across the ridge with negative and positive cpi and then wind parallel to ridge with positive and negative cpi once again and calculate the wind loads and then finally we have calculated all the wind loads that are acting on our structure wl1 wl2 wl3 wl4 on all our columns roofs and gable end structures and now we come to the part of applying these loads on our structure so before proceeding on to this application of this wind load part what i want to do is i want to end this lecture today here i will be uh, uploading this pdf document of this wind load calculation on our facebook page i will also post the link of our facebook page below this video in youtube when this video is uploaded you can download this pdf you can study on your own and if you have any confusion you can either ask on our facebook page itself comment under our post relating to this video or you can ask in message also or you can also comment under our video videos if there are any confusion since our today's lecture has crossed i think more than one hour i will not do this application of wind load in this part we will apply the wind loads and if there are again some confusion we will look at the calculation of these wind loads once again in our upcoming or next video lecture so for today i want to end this video lecture here uh, please please do go through this pdf document and also use is 875 part 3 code once before you uh, or even after you watch this video on youtube and if there are any confusion we will clear those confusions in our upcoming lecture thank you